Welcome to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. My name is Jamie Irvin, and today we are live. Did you know that the Heavy Duty Parts Report has a podcast that publishes every Monday morning? Head over to heavydutypartsreport.com and check out the podcast. You can there follow the show, subscribe for free, and you're going to be able to talk to or listen to me interview some industry experts, heavy duty parts specialists, and we're going to really focus on how to lower cost per mile and total cost of operation for trucking fleet. So head over to heavydutypartsreport.com. As well, with all of our live broadcasts, we want you to participate. We want you to ask a, a question or make a comment, and we'll do our best to bring you into the the broadcast just like our first comment here hello to you as well thank you for tuning in now today's conversation we're going to focus on the subject of suspension now if you think of of the suspension of a heavy duty truck if it fails the commercial vehicle stops working it stops making money and I wanted to talk to a manufacturer of suspension parts to really learn from them what kind of insights they could provide on how fleets can make better choices when choosing suspension components for replacement, what they can do to maintain their suspension and make it last longer, and also how is technology changing going to impact the future of costs of the suspension components themselves. So my guest today is Felipe Bumagni. He's the president of Sampa USA, and I am so happy to have him here. He's been waiting backstage. Felipe, welcome to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. So happy to have you here. Oh, I'm happy to be here, Jamie. Thank you very much for having me. So I'd like to read you a quote here, and then we can get into our conversation. A semi-truck suspension is more likely than other vehicles to become damaged due to the massive weight it carries on a consistent basis. So comparing, I guess, semi-trucks to commercial vehicles, uh, to, to automotive light duty vehicles. Mm -hmm. Common problems include broken spring hangers and leaf spring leaves, leaking shocks, a cracked torque rod or U-bolts, and air su suspension system failure. So my first question, Felipe, is what do fleets need to do to make their suspension parts last longer? Well, um, uh, of course, uh, regular maintenance and preventive maintenance and understanding what uh, how the all the components in the entire system operates uh, is key to uh, to this whole thing, right? So um, one of the most important things is to uh, perform regular checks understand what is failing and why it's failing and try to follow uh, the manufacturer's recommended uh, 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 maintenance uh, intervals and so on and so forth. Another thing that is very important is when you choose uh, replacement parts, you've got to do that very carefully. And one of the things that, uh, that people tend to to forget is that you might be might be saving a couple of dollars now, but if you install something that is of lower quality into your system, regardless of the system, whether it's steering or transmission or suspension, um, that will affect the performance not only of that particular part, but will have uh, uh, broader implications uh, throughout the entire system. Absolutely. So we've already had some uh, some of our listeners comment. Debbie, so happy. We're excited to have this conversation as well. We're happy to have you with us this Friday. And there's Brian Harrington. Uh, Brian, nice to hear from you again. Welcome to the show. So glad that you're able to uh, be here. And good point. Good point. So Felipe, you know, air ride suspension parts, like you said, they need to be inspected regularly. We've got to stay within manufacturer specifications. Let's go through uh, an inspection checklist, and maybe you can provide us a few tips on what can be done to make these parts last longer and what we should be looking for for um, some some issues with our air suspension. Let's, let's start with the air springs, the airbags. What are we looking for to give us an indication that maybe something is going wrong? So uh, an airbag is basically a balloon, right? So that it uh, inflates and deflates according to amount of uh, uh, air or pressure that you uh, that you uh, uh, used for for its inflation. So a couple of things that is uh, that are that are very important is first of all during the installation to do it properly, right? And 
to check all the peripheral uh, components as well. I'll give an example. If uh, torque rod is not performing um, uh, properly, right, because the bushing is uh, worn, uh, the airbag probably is going to fail uh, prematurely. That's the number one. Number two, so when you install the airbag, you know, it's not only the airbag that you should be looking at. It's the entire entire uh, system. Uh, one of the things that is uh, uh, that is very common is during installation, either overinflation or underinflation, and of course, overloading during uh, during operation. The other thing that is uh, uh, that needs to be checked is air leakage or pressure leakage, and that can happen at the airbag itself. It could be a result of oxidation of the top plates or the connecting uh, 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 studs. It could be a uh, an airline issue. So you have to make sure that the airbag is operating at the optimal uh, PSI level at all times. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, Brian brings out the same point. The entire system, it works as a system. So it needs to be looked at as a system. So, you know, when, when I was selling parts, sometimes the guys would come in, they would, they would put on the counter an airbag. It's got a big tear in the bag. Obviously something was maybe they were off road in a logging application or something and something wore that bag out or, or actually tore it and damaged it. When you're looking at airbags and it's not an obvious situation like that, the next place to look also is shocks. So when we're doing that overall inspection and we're saying, okay, airbags, like the pressure is good. There, there's no obvious signs of wear on it. It's not, uh, doesn't look like there's anything wrong there. We're right there. What should we be looking at when we look at the shocks? So uh, shocks are a little bit more uh, difficult to diagnose. And uh, you have a couple of uh, uh, very common uh, issues. One is shocks usually have a bushing at the eye, right? That's how the shock is connected to the frame or to the rest of the suspension. So that bushing, because of the vibration, because of uh, the, the natural aging of the rubber and so on, might, uh, might deteriorate and might fail. So that's something that is, can be visually inspected and you're going to feel vibration. You're going to see that other things, uh, other things that might happen is uh, uh, an even uh, tire wear because of a uh, faulty shocks and so on. Yeah. And I mean, with, other, that bush, with that bushing, Felipe, like you can grab a hold of it and if it's completely absolutely. shot, it's, bang, 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 bang. It's a visual and, manual yeah. inspection. Absolutely. Right. And the, the other thing that uh, there, there's another, there's a little bit of a misconception out there Shocks tend to mist, and uh, that's a normal uh, process. And uh, uh, it's almost like uh, the sweat on a beer glass, um, and it's going to look something like that. And is that, that the is same? That is is that the same? Sorry, Felipe. Is that the same regardless of whether it's like a gas shock or it's the other uh, hydraulic it, shock? It's a hydraulic shock. It, it happens more often on a hydraulic shock. Right. But however, there's also the other problem is when a seal breaks. In, in the shock, mainly on the, uh, the reservoir tube, that might uh, uh, create some uh, leakage of the fluid. And that is something that needs to be uh, checked. If, if that is happening, the shock is gone. You have to, uh, you have to replace the shock. If it's just regular misting uh, and the shock is not uh, losing any of its uh, 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 mechanical characteristics, uh, there's, it's not a problem. But most, uh, I think that more often than not, the shock will fail because of a bushing fail, failure. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Another another part of the system is the height control valve, and that works in conjunction with the airbag. So, um, if we're if we're looking at really trying to help uh, parts last longer, help fleet save money, what kinds of things should they be doing when they're checking that height control valve? What sh what would alert them to say, "Hey, there's a problem here. We we need to address it." Well, height is one of the things that, uh, uh, again, can be visually inspected. Um, you, you, you do a walk around, see if the, both, uh, both uh, sides of the truck or the trailer are at the, the proper height, if one is not higher than the other, obviously. Um, and then you start doing your diagnosis, if, if they are, if, uh, if they're not operating optimally. Uh, you need to uh, understand if it's a connecting uh, or a, a hose that dried out or the connecting of a leveling valve or uh, debris that uh, got into the airline and uh, is clogging something at the, at the valve. 
Um, so these are the the most uh, common. If uh, it's very hard to open a valve and see if something is wrong inside a valve, most people won't do that. Also, because a valve is can be relatively inexpensive, so if you suspect something is wrong, you might as well change the valve. Uh, right. But just make sure that the rest of the system, from the compressor all the way to the to the suspension, the airbag, everything is working as it should. Debbie brings out a, a good point. Crooked looking airbags are a sign of further issues. So really a lot of this comes down to that visual inspection of the suspension components. But we've got another question. It's going to take our conversation into a slightly different direction. But I think at the sure. heart of the matter, this is what people is, uh, they're, they're really looking for an answer to. And um, now uh, I'm, I'm going to say Joffrey. Not really sure of the of the name, but hello. How can you get parts that are better quality and last longer, and at the same time cost less? That's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to uh, Felipe is about the fact that parts need to be high quality. Yes, but it's not just the parts; it's the overall maintenance and the overall work that gets put into inspection and preventative maintenance that actually lowers the cost. But to the to uh, this listener's point, this is the objective of, of many fleets. So how do you answer this question, Felipe? So so Sampa does uh, things a little bit differently than uh, many other manufacturers out there, many aftermarket manufacturers. So what we do is uh, when we develop a, pro a product and we have products in several different categories, um, we uh, have to understand what the, the, that product is supposed to perform or what the, the, the performance of the product on the vehicle is supposed to be, right? In terms of durability, in terms of uh, mechanical properties, in terms of interaction with other components on the truck. And uh, only when we're fully satisfied that we understand what the product is supposed to do, we go ahead and develop, test it, validate it. And uh, uh, using the best raw materials, the best uh, uh, processes, uh, we have uh, very stringent quality controls and systems. And uh, we, the other advantage that we, 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 we bring to the table is that we make everything we sell. So uh, we don't buy and sell products from other manufacturers. We have absolute control from raw material all the way to the delivery to our, our distributor, be it be that distributor in the United States or Canada or Brazil or Australia or Germany. We are in about 160 countries. Right. So over the over the, the these past 40 years, we have perfected that technology. So uh, as long as we understand that we want to deliver a product that uh, performs equal to the OEM component that the truck came with when it left the, the plant uh, and we are we are we, we we know for a fact that that's what's going to happen when the power product is installed we can say that our product is a uh, a safe alternative to OEM now again because of our manufacturing processes be before because of uh, how we integrate our plants we can offer the same product at a very high quality, but at a, a price that is substantially lower than the OEM alternative. So, okay, so here's the thing about this subject though. I mean, what you just described in the manufacturing and, and as an aftermarket manufacturer, you get to analyze a lot of the OEM performance after Correct. they've been out into the field for a few years. And then you can reverse engineer some of the issues. You can actually make your products better than OEM Correct. because you learn some lessons that of course the OEM didn't get a chance to because they were the first to put the product out. I don't know that you can actually achieve if you're comparing just OE to aftermarket, sure, you can achieve a price reduction in, in your parts acquisition costs. But to this listener's perspective and, and to their point, I think what's important here is to buy the highest quality part available to you at the most competitive price. So like going right. with an aftermarket that is OE specific, like up to OE specs or even better but not going with the tr trying to find cheap parts because cheap parts right. don't work. They fail. And then right. labor, downtime, uh, second time back in the shop, all of that stuff adds up to far, far more than just the acquisition cost of the part. So I don't think Absolutely. acquisition cost is the primary consideration to achieve what this, this listener is trying to achieve. 
Now, and and, and uh, one thing that needs to be mentioned, we have we are not a strictly uh, an aftermarket manufacturer. We also supply several OEMs uh, around the world, right? And uh, so that interaction that we have with the OEM uh, kind of uh, permeates everything we do because we know what the OEM is expecting. Uh, but you're absolutely right. The cost of ownership, which is what every fleet and operator is mostly concerned with, um, uh, is probably the driver of the aftermarket industry today. Okay, So uh, everybody's trying to save a buck and make an extra buck, right? But there are there are some uh, some situations when you need to to stick to a certain minimum level of uh, of uh, of quality. And I'll give you an example. We were talking about air springs a few minutes ago. Um, air springs are uh, they come from everywhere, right? So they're European, they're Turkish uh, manufacturers, uh, uh, um, uh, Mexican manufacturers, American manufacturers, Brazilian manufacturers making airbags. Um, or air springs, as I should say. The difference is how do you uh, develop your um, your bellow, which is of course one of the the most important parts of the of the air spring. What kind of rubber are you using? Do you have your own compound? Do you develop your own compound like we do, or do you buy an off the shelf compound? Do you make your own top plates? You make your pistons and your your bumper stops like we do. So our airbag is 100% manufactured within our plants. The only thing that we buy are studs and hardware that we ship together with a, with an airbag. But you're specking those to a certain specification. Exactly. So we constantly do comparative testing uh, with, uh, and, and also we receive a lot of information from our OEM customers, but we do a lot of uh, comparative testing with the best brands out there. And we see the same way they do with ours. We are looking at what other people are doing and what technologies are out there, what materials uh, are being used, and see if we can always uh, uh, remain at that top level in terms of quality and uh, uh, value for money, right? So what we are delivering, and we know that for a fact, is a product that will behave and will perform and will last exactly the same, sometimes better, than uh, the original OEM. Okay. So we got a comment here from Joe. Joe, so glad to have you with us, my man. Nice to hear from you. Um, he says, systems related comment, replace components in sets, air springs in pairs, shocks in pairs. If you're not, you're doing the customer a disservice. What do you think about that, Felipe? I agree. I think that uh, I think that Joe is uh, is absolutely right. Again, and doesn't doesn't this go back to Jeffrey's comment about trying to get the lowest cost possible? That's a little counterintuitive. What Joe's saying is to add, well replace more parts, but it's not about the cost of the two parts. It's about the total cost of what happens if you don't do it the right way. Right. So let's say that you we're talking about a shock absorber, an air spring, or a leaf spring for that matter. You change one end of the axle. Um, it's it's safe to assume that within the next uh, you know uh, a very short period of time you're going to have the same problem on the other end. So the issue is not only the downtime uh, that you cannot uh, uh, use your vehicle, but also the labor and the other parts that you're going to have to uh, to replace. Mm -hmm. The other thing is I think every system in a vehicle works like an orchestra, if you will. Uh, pardon my my analogy here. So you have all these instruments playing together and trying to produce uh, a, a harmonious uh, sound. And uh, and if one instrument is off key or, or is playing at a different beat or rhythm, you're going to see that. And the same thing happens to the system on a truck. So um, you have a faulty suspension system. You might have issues with your transmission. You have might have issues with your frame. You might have uh, tire wear, excessive tire wear. Um, and so on and so forth. But within the system, and each one of the systems, whether it's an engine uh, uh, or or a turbo or a, or a transmission, if you have a faulty component, that uh, defect is going to propagate and start affecting other components within the system. So the more you wait, and the more you uh, you delay that that maintenance, 
you might be uh, facing with a much higher cost, not only in terms of downtime and 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 labor, but also additional parts that you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to replace. So, yes, uh, perhaps there are situations where uh, the repair of one end of an axle uh, uh, is sufficient. I would say that in 90% of the cases, it's not. It's a it's a it's being kind of penny wise and dollar foolish here. You yeah. will save money on the spot. It's going to end up costing you a lot more later. That's right. We see this time and time again. You know, as you were talking about that, it makes me think of of the direction that class eight vehicles are going in. They're certainly getting more and more complicated. We're seeing the introduction of all kinds of new technology that are affecting everything from uh, obviously powertrain and, and power source all the way through to drive axles and suspension components what is the future going to look like when it comes to our suspension components as these vehicles get more and more complicated they get electrified where are we headed and and how is that going to impact the strategy for maintenance and repair on these vehicles right and 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 there are several different ways to look at the same this uh, answer this question right so the big uh, big uh, gorilla in the room here or the or the elephant in the room in the room is uh, electrification so we're in the very beginning of the curve of course companies like tesla and nikola and, and so on are uh, farther advanced in uh, in product development and then you have other more traditional suppliers out there oems such as daimler and volvo that are coming out with products that are transitioning into full electrification. So there are two ways of looking at this. Uh, obviously, the more innovative designs, the more revolutionary designs, we require different materials. So if we're looking at steel and aluminum today, in certain, we might be looking at composite or plastics or fiber in, in the next few years. Um, if we're looking at uh, rubber compounds. So I'll give an example. Sampa, Sempa is developing together with uh, with uh, one of the most presti prestigious universities in England. We're developing a new compound, a rubber compound that could be used on a torque rod or uh, or a, or a suspension bushing that will change its uh, mechanical properties uh, according to electric input. So you have a sensor that is going to be connected to that component. That it will make it harder or more elastic or more flexible, uh, depending on the input that a vehicular computer will send to that particular uh, uh, component. That's a little bit of science fiction, right? It's it's not going to happen next week or next year, but definitely is going to going to happen. So we are looking at traditional products that will have to be modified, such as tires, torque rods, leaf springs, uh, brake, uh, brake discs, the forces, the stresses, the speeds that we're going to be working, the weight of the vehicle is, might be drastically different. So there are two schools here. One is the totally new design, such as Tesla and Nikola, and I'm not being paid here, and I don't, uh, I'm not endorsing any brand or anything like that. And uh, the other, the other are the the transition from current design to innovative de designs, and that's what, for instance, Volvo is doing, uh, putting out a new vehicle that is uh, uh, electric, but using a lot of the same components that uh, are on the their trucks today, on the uh, internal combustion engine trucks. Uh, okay. Today. So like Debbie brings up here, loose U-bolts are the biggest cause of bushing and, and leaf air uh, spring and air spring failures. So when we're trying to help technicians serve the customers that they serve, owner operators and fleets and help them save money, make their suspension, we go from advice like this that is mechanical all the way through to these new technologies. So can you share with us something maybe that technicians don't know about chassis related products or suspension related products that they need to know? Let's give them something of value and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the wider range of products that Sampa manufactures. So drop a, drop a value yeah. bomb on us, Felipe. Okay, so I would like to uh, to uh, to use Debbie's comment uh, as, a, as a hook U-boat, right? A okay. relatively inexpensive uh, product that you uh, that you uh, uh, use in basically every suspension today. I, I, I cannot think of the top of my head 
of any suspension that doesn't have at least a pair of uh, U-boats in uh, on it. And one thing that people do not remember to do, and often don't do it frequently enough, is to check the torque of the torque rods on the the torques on. I apologize, uh, the U-boats on the in the suspension. So every time you do a repair, every time for regardless of how minor this repair is, you need to retorque your torque rods, your um, U-bolts. Your U-bolts, okay? That is very important. And you have to measure that, uh, that torque on, um, uh, with, with the proper equipment, but also do it periodically. Those U-bolts coming loose, and Debbie's absolutely right here, will uh, generate catastrophic failures for all kinds of other parts. Uh, she mentions, I think, uh, leaf springs. Uh, but that will also affect the torque rods. It will affect the the, the weldments or the hangers and the the equalizers. It will affect the axle. It will affect uh, the airbags as well, air springs, and of course shock absorbers. So uh, it's a it's a it's a maintenance procedure that is very uh, very easy to perform, and um, and that if not done so or done properly can cause tremendous problems to uh, to the vehicle as a whole, to the suspension system. Okay. So, so now, Sampa, oh, sorry, go ahead, Felipe. No, I just wanted to say, um, there will be such uh, procedures, perhaps different designs in uh, of uh, U-boats in the future. Maybe the leaf springs are gonna change, they're gonna be uh, fully composite as uh, they are in certain applications in, in Europe already. Uh, but other than that, these, uh, 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 the recommended practices will only have to be adapted to new designs, but they will persist and uh, be part of our routine and the operator's routine. The, f the fundamentals will, will remain the same. The fundamentals are always the same. Yeah. yeah. So, Felipe, you sell over 40,000 parts, 138 countries. You operate 11 factories. Uh, we've talked about suspension today, but what other product categories does Sampa manufacture, just so people are aware of the width and depth and breadth of product that you actually manufacture? Uh, so, um, we, we do manufacture... Uh, let me backtrack a little bit here. So SEMP has been around um, and uh, been manufacturing products for over 50 years now. Uh, we only have relatively recently come into the United States as a company, set up our operations in North America, have our warehouses uh, in, uh, in the United States. Um, and uh, what we do in America is a little bit different than what we do in Europe. And I'll give you an example. In addition to a full steering program, suspension uh, programs, and some, and some uh, um, axle and transmission uh, components, uh, we have been selling in Europe uh, a full range of uh, fifth wheel um, uh, products, not only the top plates, but also uh, ancillary products. So we sell not only the top plates, we sell um, uh, the kingpin for the fifth wheel, and we sell repair kits for fifth wheels, right? So we have a full range. We developed the range uh, for the American market. So these are prob probably right now the only above frame products that we sell in North America. Everything else we sell here uh, is steering, suspension, and uh, axle and transmission related. Okay? So all below frame. The only okay. items that we sell our uh, fifth wheels above frame would be fifth wheels, uh, uh, kingpin, uh, the fifth wheel kingpin, and the and the repair kits for fifth wheels. So you you also have those connection management parts as well as all uh, the below we have, frame. Yeah, it's not a full uh, connection uh, uh, program, only related to the fifth wheels. Right, makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So what what's happening in the trucking industry that's got you excited? Well, um, we, I think that we're we are we're going through a very interesting process uh, that is a challenge for everybody. Uh, there is new technology being introduced into the market, of course, with electrification, but also other challenges like uh, um, uh, uh, weight reduction, which is something that has been uh, in our uh, in our minds already for the past 10, 15 years, and continues being an issue um, and a challenge. So we our relationships with uh, with our OEMs, that's often a topic of conversation. How can we reduce 
um, uh, vehicular weight so that we can have more paid weight on the on the platform, right? So there are new technologies coming out. Uh, there are only certain things that I can divulge here because some of them are still under under uh, uh, research and development. But we are looking at new materials for torque rods. We're looking at new materials for um, for um, hangers and uh, equalizers for the primarily trailer suspensions that will significantly generate cost reduction and as well as weight reduction. And that is something that we're going to be introducing into the market in the next couple of years. Okay, so that is uh, that is very exciting. The other interesting thing is uh, how we've um, we've managed to uh, develop a very interesting um, uh, network of distributors here in North America in a relatively short period of time. And we're very happy uh, uh, with the results so far for Sampa. We are beginning to be noticed. We're beginning to be uh, uh, recognized as a supplier of uh, a quality brand product at very competitive prices. And, um, and I don't think that for the past few months we've gone uh, one day without signing up new distributors in uh, in this uh, in these markets, both in the U.S. and in Canada. You've been watching the Heavy Duty Parts Report live today. My name is Jamie Irvin, and we've been speaking with Felipe Bumagni, president of Sampa USA. To learn more, visit sampa.com. Felipe, thank you so much for being on the show. I have a feeling with some My of those pleasure. new products coming, you'll be back on the show in the future. I hope so. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, take care. So this brings another edition of the Heavy Duty Parts Reports live stream to a conclusion. Thank you so much to the audience today. What a great outpouring of support for today's episode. Such quality comments from some, some new people and some old friends of the show. So thank you so much. Next week, we're going to be getting into a, a new a new format for the, the live stream a little bit. We're going to be doing some more analysis of what's going on in the industry, what's going on with specific parts related issues that are affecting the trucking industry. We're going to be talking about some of those things. So make sure that you come back next week and uh, tune into another live stream. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you next week.